So I don't know about you, but I had a little wobble this week. I started to lose a little bit of my motivation, sort of around Thursday and Friday, and thinking, what am I doing everything for? We're in lockdown, this is never going to end. Fortunately, I got over it. <laughs> and it got me thinking about how, just before Christmas, we had that promise that we were going to be able to see our relatives at Christmas, and then it just never happened. All of a sudden, it was all over. None of us could go and see our relatives. And now it's the end of January, and we're still in exile. We're still not able to see our friends, our relatives who are far away. And the only way we can see them is online. Even one another, we can only see each other online most of the time. But we can dream of that time when it will be over and we can do that again. I wonder, what would be the first thing you do when you see your family again after we're able to? We may still not be able to hug or kiss, I don't know. I know that's what I would love to do, if we're allowed to. But of course we find out how we each other are, have a good laugh, chat about old times, ask about other people that we know, inquire about them, have a special dinner together, of course, right? And what a joyful reunion that will be. Unless the manner of our parting was not a happy one. That would be a different matter. What if our brother or sister, mum or dad, son or daughter, really hurt us last time we were together? That would be difficult. We wouldn't know if we could trust them. Would we even know what to say? Well, that's the situation Joseph finds himself in when we pick up his story today. He's been in Egypt now for more than 20 years. He's lived through being a slave, then a trusted servant, then falsely accused and put into prison for years where he was trusted to look after the other prisoners. And finally, a long way down the line, he was released when he interpreted Pharaoh's dreams correctly. And he was put in charge of Pharaoh's food storage and distribution second only to the king in power and authority. And his brothers come to Egypt. Last time Joseph saw his brothers, he was just 17 years old, only a kid. And his brothers were trying to kill him. They were jealous of his special treatment in the family and the blatant favoritism of their father. They were sick of Joseph's boasting about his crazy dreams that they would all bow down before him one day. They were hacked off that their dad sent Jacob, their dad Jacob sent Joseph to check up on them. So they plotted to get rid of him. They'd thrown Joseph into a disused well in the middle of nowhere and left him to die, callously eating their picnic while he lay there in the pit, pleading with him, with them to help him. Only their eldest brother, Reuben, had ideas of rescuing Joseph and taking him back to their father. But that plan came to nothing. While Reuben's back was turned, Judah said, Hey guys, here's some foreign traders. Let's sell him and make a profit out of our brother. And they agreed. Silver exchanged hands, and Joseph was loaded onto a wagon. He was miles away before Joseph could carry out his plan of taking Joseph home to Dad. Now, having no idea of what had happened to Joseph after they shook hands on that deal, did they even give him a second thought? The brothers had come to Egypt. Their father Jacob had told them to come and buy grain as they'd become victims of that same famine that affected Egypt. As the Pharaoh's right-hand man, in charge of all the distribution of food, Joseph finds himself face to face with the men who tried to kill him all those years ago. Clearly, it's not going to be the joyful reunion that we were just talking about. It's complicated. The brothers don't recognize Joseph. Why would they? They're not expecting to see Joseph in Egypt. Joseph has grown up. 
He's become a man, and a powerful man at that. He's second only to Pharaoh in authority. He is dressed and groomed like an Egyptian. And he talks like an Egyptian. That sounds like a song. I was thinking. <laughs> as far as they know, he is an Egyptian. But Joseph recognises his older brothers. And his heart is filled with a yearning for his home and his family. But can he trust them? He had 11 brothers, and only 10 have come. Is his little brother Benjamin still alive? Now, Joseph and Benjamin shared a mother, and she was Jacob's favourite wife. Her name was Rachel. And Rachel had died giving birth to little Benjamin. Where was Benjamin? thinks Joseph. Perhaps these brothers had killed him too, who knows? And what of their father, Jacob? Joseph means to find out what's going on with his family, but he wants to do it his way. He doesn't know if he can trust these brothers to tell the truth. Now Joseph's got an advantage here. His brothers are unguarded, at his mercy, not knowing who he really is. So he plays them. Joseph forms an elaborate plan to test them while also hopefully getting to see Benjamin for himself and satisfying himself as to his little brother's well-being. Have the brothers changed? Do they still care more about money than their own flesh and blood? Are they still beset by jealousy? So Joseph pretends to be suspicious of the brothers. He, he accuses them of lying and being spies. He tells them he won't believe in their innocence unless they bring their youngest brother back to Egypt. He claps them in prison for three days and lets them stew. On the third day, he tells them he's going to keep one of them behind in prison here in Egypt as surety, while the rest of them take the grain back to their families. But they must come back with their youngest brother to prove they're not lying. Now this is a turning point for the brothers. I don't know, is it the prospect of potentially losing another brother to an Egyptian prison that pricks their consciences? Is it the realisation that it's Benjamin that's being asked for, the youngest and the brother of Joseph? Benjamin, who's now the father's favourite since he, Joseph is no more, or so they think. Is it the fact that this strange Egyptian overlord is telling them that he fears God, their God, the God of Israel? Well, whatever it is, their thoughts finally turn to the brother that they betrayed and sold mm. all those years ago. Joseph listens in on their conversation. Now remember, they don't know that he can understand them. They think he's an Egyptian. They're speaking their own language. And he hears this. Surely we're being punished because of our brother, they say. We ignored his distress when he pleaded with us for his life. And that's why this trouble has now come upon us. Joseph hears for the first time that Reuben, his eldest brother, had tried to save his life, but his brothers wouldn't listen. He knows that these brothers of his ignored his cry for help. Now the brothers realise there are consequences to their actions. Now their past is catching up with them. For 20 years or more, they tried to bury their memories of what they did to Joseph. But God, the just, does not forget. God, the just, sees all. These men are beginning to reap what they have sown. Not a harvest of righteousness, but a harvest according to their deeds. God is speaking to them, and what they are hearing frightens them. Listening to them talk, Joseph is in danger of losing it for a moment. They're his brothers. He turns away so the brothers can't see the tears in his eyes. Reuben had stuck up for him all those years ago. The others had heard him crying for help, but they'd done nothing. Then he recovers himself. Joseph calls for the second eldest brother, Simeon, to be shackled. He sends the other brothers on their way, but not before he's left instructions to secretly return their money to them, along with the grain that they brought. Here's a twist in Joseph's cunning plan. When the brothers open their sacks of grain on their way home, 
find the money there, they are absolutely horrified. Their hearts sink and they look at one another saying, what is this that God has done to us? Well, if they didn't fear God before, they fear him now. Are they going to be accused of stealing now? What will they do? Well, the answer is nothing. Sometimes true repentance takes a while. Being sorry for what you've done is not the same as repenting. Believe me, I know. The only thing these brothers do is report what's happened to their father Jacob and then go ahead and feed their families leaving Simeon stuck in an Egyptian prison while they just get on with their lives. Now I know they didn't ask for this, but could they really just leave Simeon there to rot? But that's exactly what they do. Well, I say that, Reuben does try, kind of. Jacob is understandably loath to, to let Benjamin go back with them in case he loses him too. It must have been so hard for the brothers to hear the way he speaks to them. You have deprived me of my children, says Jacob to his children. Jacob is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you want to take Benjamin. Everything is against me. Now Reuben tries to mollify him with this generous offer. You can put both my sons to death if I don't bring him back to you, he says. Entrust him to my care and I will bring him back. Well, can Jacob trust Benjamin? Uh, can Jacob trust Reuben to take care of Benjamin when he couldn't even keep Joseph safe? And when he doesn't even seem bothered about the life of his own children? No. No, he says, my son will not go down there with you. His brother is dead and he is the only one left. If harm comes to him on the journey you are taking, you will bring my grey head down to the grave in sorrow. Mm -hmm. It seems that Jacob still has a lot to learn. He's still showing favouritism. He even tried emotional blackmail, saying he's going to die with grief for his two favourite sons. So they let it be. Benjamin stays at home. Simeon stays in prison. It's only when the food runs out again that Jacob brings up the matter again. A long time's passed by now. Mm -hmm. Go back to Egypt and buy us some more food, Jacob tells the brothers, completely forgetting that they can't go back without Benjamin. Judah reminds him of this fact. The man warned us solemnly, you will not see my face again unless my, your brother is with you. If you'll send our brother along with us, we'll go down and buy food for you. But if you won't send him, we won't go down. Jacob won't listen, but turns on them instead, complaining they shouldn't have told the man about their younger brother in the first place. Now listen to this. The other brothers try to justify themselves, saying they were forced into telling the Egyptian about Benjamin. And how were they to know that they didn't, he'd insist they'd bring Benjamin to him? But Judah steps up at this point. Judah whose their idea it had been to sell Joseph for a handful of silver. Judah is the one who shows he really has changed. Judah says this to his father, send the boy along with me and we will go at once so that we and you and our children may live and not die. Mm. I myself will guarantee his safety. You can hold me personally responsible for him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him here before you, I will bear the blame before you all my life. Judah takes responsibility. And by his actions, he saves the lives of his father, his brothers, and all their children. Because Jacob finally relents. Jacob finally shows a little faith in the God who has saved and protected him in the past. Go then if you must, he says, but take with you some expensive gifts and return the silver that is put in your sack. Take a brother with you, go straight away. And may God Almighty grant you mercy before the man, so that he'll let your other brother and Benjamin come back with you. Mind you, he can't resist one last turn of the screw, making it all about him as usual. 
As for me, if I am bereaved, I am bereaved. So the brothers go back to Egypt. Now Joseph has a few more surprises for them. When he sees that Benjamin is with them, he orders his servant to prepare a dinner for them all in his house. The brothers know nothing of this plan and they're frightened when they're taken to Joseph's house. They speak to Joseph's butler and they explain all about the silver that they found in their sacks, but he tells them, your God, the God of your father, has given you treasure in your sacks. And indeed he has, for God has been at work in all of Joseph's actions. Simeon is brought out to them and they get ready for the meal. <clears throat> I wonder if the brothers noticed how their host asked tenderly about the health of their father. Did they wonder why this strange Egyptian spoke so kindly to their little brother Benjamin, asking God to be gracious to him? Did they question why he rushed out of the room in turmoil before coming back to begin the feast? Stranger still, still, when the brothers sit down to eat, they find they've been seated in order of their ages. How could he know this? And that their, their little brother Benjamin is given five times as much food as the rest of them. Will the old jealousies resurface? It seems not. There is no hint that any of them resent the special treatment that Benjamin gets. And that's where we leave the story. Now, what can we learn from this bizarre turn of events? Mm. Well, I think there's three things we can learn, and I'm not going to take long over them. Firstly, we see that the spotlight has turned from Joseph to his father and brothers. We see that God's work in them is ongoing. Mm. Jacob has not yet learned how destructive his favouritism is. But the brothers have learned to overcome their jealousy. And they genuinely seem to care about Benjamin and be sorry for what they did to Joseph. Isn't it true that God's work in our lives often takes a long time? Between feeling sorry and actually changing our ways, it's certainly true in my life. Perhaps we don't actually take those positive steps to show that we've repented. We're afraid to, or... We're not quite there yet. Perhaps like Jacob, we look to blame others for our misfortune instead of letting God actually speak to us. And sometimes God needs to speak to us repeatedly until we realise that God wants us to step up and take responsibility, showing the fruit of repentance like Judah did. So God's work in us takes a long time. Secondly, as Reverend Amy said a few weeks ago, this is not just the story of one family, but it's God's story. Joseph has already learned that he is not the main player in this story. God is. When the brothers come and bow down to him as they did in his dreams, it's not to make Joseph feel good. It's because by God's grace and mercy, Joseph has the power to save their lives. That's an important lesson too. When God gives us gifts, it's not just to make us feel good, but so we can use those gifts to help others. If God gives us power and authority, it's not so we can boast, as maybe Joseph did when he was a teenager, but it's so we can use that power for good and so God gets the glory. So this is not just our story we're living, this is God's story. What are we going to do with it? Thirdly, we never know what the consequences of our actions will be. Our Gospel reading sees an old man and an old woman worshipping in God's temple, and this is many, many centuries after Jacob and his family have actually died. When a young couple bring their baby into the temple to present him before God, these two elders get very excited. Simeon, not the same Simeon that was in the story, just the same name. The old man, Simeon, prophesies that this child brings salvation. That this child is the light to reveal God to the nations. Anna, 
gives thanks to God and tells everyone about the child who will bring redemption. Well, this child is Jesus, God's beloved. Now, if you look at the genealogy of Jesus, which we do all the time, don't we? <laughs> it's there at the start of Matthew's Gospel, if you want to check it out. Jesus' ancestry is traced back through many, many generations, through the kings of the tribe of Judah, to Solomon, to David, and ultimately to Judah himself. Yes, that same Judah. The man who had sold his brother, Joseph, for silver, who showed how much he changed, who guaranteed the safety of his youngest brother. Mm. He is the man whose tribe became preeminent in Judah, um, in Israel, the tribe of Judah, the kingdom of Judah, whose descendants include King David, the man after God's own heart, and Jesus, the beloved of God, the saviour of the world. And that's what I want to leave us with. See, it doesn't matter how badly we screwed up, if we're willing to face the consequences of what we've done, if we're willing to give it all to God and take responsibility, God will use it to fulfil his purpose in history Amen. and to bring about salvation. Mm. As we say in our communion service, this is God's story and this is our song. Doesn't matter what we've done, we bring it to God he makes something beautiful out of it. Amen. Maybe not now, maybe not tomorrow, but God uses everything. I'm going to leave you with that, and let's just spend a few moments now giving it all to God, whatever it may be that's in your heart today. Just give it all to God, and I'll give you some space so he can speak to us. Lord God, may we put our trust in you and keep giving it all to you, knowing that you not only have our best interests at heart, but want to use us for your plan of salvation. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.